So I'm going to get things rolling, but I'd like to invite uh, anyone to make your way down to the, the microphones here. Uh, and it is important to come to a microphone, not only for the, uh, hearing us ourselves in the room, but it's being recorded. So um, I'll get things started. So many questions. I don't want to really share you, but, <laughs> but, I, but I will start uh, with the one thing, because as you were speaking, I'd written down, what about the killers? What about the rapists? And then you, you went there. Um, what did you learn talking to people who did such terrible things? I mean, is there? I think that everyone is a story. And, and I think that even if, and I mean, I remember one time talking to this horrible man called Arkan, who was the leader of these militias in Eastern Bosnia, which basically started ethnic cleansing and mass rape. And I literally was physically ill speaking to him but I just, I wanted to know what kind of evil was in his mind, like what the plan was, how they justify it. And the interesting thing is people always justify it. There's always a reason, whether it's a Hutu in Rwanda saying, we had to kill the Tutsis, they were cockroaches, or Bosnian Serbs saying, we were vindicated in World War II, his father killed my father, and now I'm taking my revenge. People, there's always a backstory to it. And I suppose as a journalist, we have to listen to that. But as a human being, it's really hard because we naturally, you know, our compassion is always going to go to the victim. At least mine does. Um, but I often have to kind of force myself to, to listen to the other side. So that's true. Like it's obvious that the the torture, the murder, it's brutal. There's there's nothing. There is only one way to see it for most people. Um, is there any redemption to find? Like I guess because like, even when you say that, it just seems like there's still an us and them. That there's another kind of person on the planet that is not really to be understood. It, I think it also goes to whether you fundamentally believe people are good or evil. And if, if man does have this great capacity for evil, and I do think that I've sat in the room with people that I had chills down my neck because I knew that they were the incarnation of evil. Um, I once sat up all night with this Bosnian Serb leader um, called Nikola Koljevic, who actually went to university here in Canada. He was a brilliant scholar, a Shakespearean scholar. And he was responsible for the destruction. He was the destruction of Sarajevo. Like he's the one that said, bomb the library, bomb the hospital. And the thing was, he was a brilliant man. He was brilliant. And he was so riddled with jealousy and rivalry. He was a professor at the University of Sarajevo, and he had been passed over. Sorry, is that working? He had been passed over for an appointment. And he destroyed, or his men destroyed, the National Library of Sarajevo, which was, I don't know if anyone remembers, the images of these beautiful Ottoman Empire books up in flames. So, I, I mean, as I was talking to him, I literally did think, he's the devil. But I had to listen to him. And in the end, by the way, he killed himself after the war. He killed himself. But he missed when he shot himself, and so he died this agonizing, painful death. It took him about 10 hours to die alone. So it, the whole thing was like a Shakespearean tragedy. One of the things I was thinking about when you were saying this, um, and I will go to the microphones next, is um, you know, if you look at some of the rhetoric today, yeah. um, this idea that you know we have to be afraid of people who are barbaric. The we don't other. understand. Well, yeah, but it's there that they're barbaric people. Yeah. Look what they do. They behead people. We don't, you know. So it's actually, it, it is used in a political sense in, by by some people to keep the separation, to keep a divide. You know, and I, I wonder about your reflections on that. Hate rhetoric to me is really dangerous because in Rwanda. Um, there's actually been studies done. There was something called the Radio Mil Colin, Thousand Hills, and it, it basically um, stirred up. It, you know, it, every, every morning it would come on and say, kill Tutsis, kill Tutsis, Tutsis are cockroaches. And the Tutsis were um, taller, were fair-skinned, very 
elegant, favored by the Europeans, the colonizers, and the Hutus were resentful and angry. So the radio, the media, stirred them up um, to the point where it, it, you know, that and political rivalries so that the genocide happened. So I'm really sensitive to hate rhetoric. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I, when I analyze what's happening in my country, and you tell me in some ways some things happening here, um, I think we have to be extra cautious of it. I mean, it, on the other hand, we have this extreme snowflakeism, what I call like this <laughs> millennial um, oversensitivity to the point where, you know, with my students, I have to be aware that I'm not causing trigger reactions or, I mean, they're, they're ultra, ultra sensitive. <laughs> and you can't say, I mean, I said homosexual in a class. And they said, you can't say that anymore. You have to say queer. And I said, really? So I actually had to ask for a list of vocabulary that you can and cannot use. So that's another extreme. But I mean, I, I don't want to compare it to hate rhetoric. Fair enough. Um, what a bizarre world. Yes. <laughs> to contrast. Go right ahead. Thank you for uh, sharing with us your experiences. I am not trying to excuse anybody, but the provocation that you mentioned before, these people who are provoked are never reported and never listened to. Unfortunately, the same thing is actually happening in the United States today. There were an awful lot of people in the US who were never listened to. That's why there is such a huge backlash. It wouldn't have happened otherwise. But just notice this, that the transition happened without bloodshed in the United States. That's the power of our democracy. The only thing that I wonder about is that after Trump was elected, the day after, they want to depose him. He was chosen by the people. Yeah. He should be allowed to serve his term. Yes. They can, they can object to some of his policies, but they can't demand that he should be removed from office. Thank you. No, you're, you're absolutely right. He was, he was elected democratically. And there is a whole section of the society that isn't liberal, elite New York or Los Angeles people who felt marginalized by the elitism of the Obama administration. And I do understand that. And I often think, really, what I should be working on now is driving across America and talking to people and finding out what, you know, what is happening inside America. I'm not an American expert. All, all I see and what I analyze is his, his messaging, which scares me because I think he is manipulating these people who aren't, haven't been listened to and people who the healthcare system is broken and the education system is broken and they can't get jobs and they've been marginalized. But I think he manipulates them, them with this, the, the rhetoric, which is often scary. But yes, I, I completely understand your point. Thank you. Go right ahead. Uh, I want to first off thank you for your career and for your talk tonight. Uh, the work you do is so important. Uh, I have, uh, if you'll forgive me, I'd like to ask two questions. First, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about uh, how you keep yourself safe when you're doing the work, uh, how you choose fixers, how you make decisions about where to go, where not to go, the extent to which you think that you can actually make decisions that keep you safe, or is it kind of a, a bit of a crapshoot? And secondly, I wonder if you can talk a bit about uh, what's happened in the, what, in the journalism business. There are many fewer foreign bureaus than there once were. I suspect there are still ways to, to do the work. Uh, and I wonder, so if you could talk about that a little bit too. Really good question. Um, well, initially when I started, there was absolutely no protection, no, um, no advice about what to do. And when I first went to Sarajevo, which was so dangerous because it was besieged and encircled by Serb gunners on the, on the high ridges and, and tanks, and they were shelling and bombing. And you had to drive in on a single road, which was called Sniper's Alley. And there were also snipers that would shoot at your car. Um, you, you really just took your life in your hands. And only, we started wearing flak jackets, but in retrospect, that was 25 years ago, they weren't very good flak jackets. A few people wore helmets, which we all should have worn, because of course, that's where, you know, that's where they shoot at you. And, um, but we had no, we kind of got knowledge from each other, like don't go down that road or 
when I first entered the Holiday Inn, where I lived for the next three years, one whole side was bombed. And it was because it was in direct view of the, a tank that was on the hill, and they kept sending in tank rounds. So people would say, you know, don't, don't, use, don't walk by that side of the building, and if you walk by, you have to run. And you kind of learned from people, too. Like, the Bosnian people would gather on corners until there was 10 or 20 of them, and then they would run in a group across a road so that the snipers would have a harder time picking them out. I learned that way. And then I'd say about 1994, 95, the CBC, the BBC, the big American networks all got together and decided that, like so many of us were being killed, they had to start doing these training programs. So they got these guys who were like former special forces to train us. And it was kind of amusing because they hated us. <laughs> they really did. They thought, like, they hated journalists. They thought we were all wimps and whiners and losers and so they really made our and it would be a week long hostile environment course and they would just beat the hell out of us like they would the one exercise was um, a kidnapping thing which actually was so useful I, I think of it all the time and they you it'd be during the day you never knew when it would happen and they would come out and they would be you know and these were special forces guys so they were really scary and they'd be dressed in hoods their faces blackened and they would grab us put hoods on us and shove us into car trunks or, you know, it, one time it was winter and they made us all lie on the ground for an hour and they kept hitting our feet when we moved and, and they would do these scenarios to teach us what to do if we were kidnapped, when's the moment you can run away. They did a lot of mine work, like teaching us um, if you found yourself in a minefield, how to identify mines. They did a lot of... Um, of teaching us if we were caught in firefights, like which way to run into fire. And in fact, after I did one course with a group of people from CBC who made it very entertaining because they brought along a lot of bourbon and whiskey. <laughs> and um, um, I went to Sierra Leone and it was at the time I was telling you about and um, my very good friend uh, drove up a road with his, he worked for Reuters and he was ambushed and murdered by the rebel soldiers. And two of his cameramen got away and escaped into the woods, and they were hunted down for 24 hours by rebel soldiers. But they survived. And at the funeral, they said to me, you know, the reason I survived is because of that hostile environment course, because they taught us to run into the fire and run around the soldiers. And, and then they taught them how to survive in a jungle, so they... So they did. So that helped a lot. Um, but then, you know, kidnapping by ISIS and being beheaded, there's nothing that could prepare you for that. So I just basically, after Steve Sutloff was killed, who I really adored, who was like a little brother for me, um, I stopped going into Syria that way because I just thought, I'm, at one point, I used to think, they'll never kidnap me because I'm a woman. And then I realized that that's, they don't care. Um, and I just, I don't want to die in a desert in an orange jumpsuit for nothing. If I'm going to die for something, I'm going to die for doing or bringing a story that is going to impact policy in some way or make a change, not for nothing. Um, so I think you really have to choose, and especially, I have a child, and that changed everything for me. You know, I really have to choose what will make a difference. Um, I've just spent a year working on a story about the eradication of Christians in the Middle East by, by the Islamic State. Um, and you know how they're being driven out, the most ancient community in northern Iraq and Syria, and how they're being um, pushed out. Egypt, there was just an attack last week by the Islamic State on Copt Christians. So I tend to work on projects. I want to start on something on Yemen, on starvation. Um, I work a lot on the chemical attacks in, in, uh, in Syria that were denied, and I work a lot on Russian propaganda, and disinformation inside the Syrian war. So now I pick and choose. Your second question, journalism, it's changed radically. You know, in the old days, <laughs> in the old days, um, the times where I worked would give me a packet of money, a satellite phone, and a flak jacket, and basically say, go, 
we don't want to hear from you for three months. And you know, I'd have enough money to kind of hire a local fixer, and I would usually find my fixers at universities. Even if I was in South Sudan, and the university was a dirt floor, you could find someone who spoke English. So that's, I usually would get my fixers that way, and I've always had incredibly, a fixer is someone that basically helps you on the ground if you're by yourself and translates for you, or basically for me becomes my brother or sister or my best friend. Um, there are ways to still operate. It's increasingly difficult, but you know, I always encourage, a lot of my colleagues when young people say, I want to be a journalist, they say, don't become a banker, don't become a journalist, but I say, absolutely. You know, more than ever, there's a need for it, and there's ways to make it work. There's lots of organizations now that give grants for projects. Um, you know, Jeff Bezos bought the Washington Post, and there, there is money out there. You just have to be, have perseverance, you have to be very strategic, and you have to be focused, you know, on is there one project you really want to work on? Um, and, and that's what I always advise young reporters, or, or any reporter. So, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for I just want to start off saying how much you're an inspiration to me. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for being here. I am a journalism student, and I want to be a war correspondent. And so my question Don't is... Don't tell your mother. Yeah. <laughs> 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 My question is, how do you separate being a human being and being a journalist? Well, I don't, which is probably a lot of my problem. I mean, I still, when I was coming up here after seeing that film, I was still, you know, I get very emotional, um, and more so since I've had a child. I mean, I never was able to tolerate the real pain of other people, especially children. And the very first time in central Bosnia, I saw a kid who had, had shrapnel in his gut. And intestinal wounds are the most painful thing. And there was no painkiller. And he was screaming in agony. And I went, and it wasn't a hospital. There was no hospital. It was like a, a triage, a field hospital. And there was a nurse trying to calm him down. But he was going to die. He was going to bleed to death. There was no anesthetic. And um, I threw up. I went outside and I threw up. And then I realized that I couldn't really do my job unless I kind of held it together. But at night, when I would come home and I'd go in my sleeping bag, I would cry and cry and cry. And you know what? I think that's what made me resilient. Because when the time came and all of us were tested for post-traumatic stress disorder, I didn't have it, oddly enough. I mean, I kept saying to Anthony Feinstein, who's this amazing Canadian psychiatrist who devoted his life to working on trauma. And I said to him, why don't I have it? Why does everyone else have it? And he said, because you write about it. And, and you, by writing about it, I felt that I was, I was getting it out, but I was also I was doing some kind of a service that someone would read it, and it might have an effect. And you know the, the simple answer to your question is I never, I was always a human being. I never had that tough thing. I, I envied people who did. But then I always felt that I couldn't really write the way I wanted to write unless I really passionately felt it. It wasn't a handicap in the end. Thank you, and good luck to you in your work. Let me, if I might, follow up there, because you're going down that path. So how do you measure? that what you've done has ever made a difference? How would you articulate that? Well, one time I really felt it did was um, during the Srebrenica, the fall of Srebrenica, I wrote an article. And then I was working for the Sunday Times of London. And that had a huge reach. Um, and I wrote a story about a little boy who had been blinded by a shell. And for about two weeks, I went and I sat by his bed and held his hand. And he would just say, like, what's happened? What's happened? Why can't I see? And it was the most horrific thing, because you had to explain to him that he might not ever see. And I wrote this story, which came from a place of great pain. And um, Margaret Thatcher read it. And at that point, she, had, she wasn't prime minister still, but she had some role in the government. And she went into parliament armed with this 
you know, battering <laughs> all the other politicians. We have to do something. And I don't think that was a turning point, but it certainly had a huge effect because it mobilized the British public and then that had a knock-on effect to, to Clinton and then it had a knock-on effect here and then it had a knock-on effect. And happy ending to that story, about three years ago, I got a message from the Sunday Times where I haven't worked for years saying, this boy called, this man in Florida called Sayad Bakich is trying to reach you. And I said, okay, well give him my email. And I opened my email, and it was this little boy, oh. now grown up. And he said to me, I just want to tell you that after your story came out, a very wealthy family in America, in Florida, read it and adopted me. They did everything. They found me. They brought me over. They gave me the best medical treatment in the world. I never regained my eyesight, but they sent me to the best schools in all of Florida, and I, um, I learned how to type on a... You know, he had all these amazing instruments. He could drive. He could do everything. And he was an entrepreneur. And he was a businessman. And I just, I thought, wow, you know, um, it, it says in the Torah, if you could save one life, then you could save humanity. And, you know, that was a beautiful story. Yeah. Take so, two more questions, and then I think we'll have to wrap up, unfortunately. But. Uh, I'm happy to talk a few. <laughs> so. I real, I, yeah, I realize that bullets don't have gendered on, gender on them, and, and that, as you said, women can be kidnapped, etc. But could you um, sort of talk about the fact there actually may be an advantage to being a female in, a, in, in these conflict zones, a female journalist? You have access to sort of in the Middle yeah. East to half the population that the male journalists can't talk to, et cetera. No, absolutely. And, and actually, in the early days, like pre-ISIS, I used to always feel in the Middle East I was so safe because, in a way, because of their horror of women, they didn't want to deal with you, you know? So they, didn't, they wouldn't kidnap you or they wouldn't... Um, they were just, ugh. Um, but it, you, I did find that being a woman had... If soldiers would always speak to me because they either thought I was their girlfriend or their sister and now probably their mother um, and that they they could open up to you some it's true that there were there were also men that just like felt you know this is a boys club and you have no right to be here and you're you're going into a world where you don't belong um, and if that was the case I just didn't, I mean, I'm, I've never been one to push an interview or a story. I'm not that kind of a reporter. If someone doesn't want to talk to me, they don't, I, I'm not going to push it. But absolutely, and also it had advantages in the way that, in a funny kind of way, and the men won't like this here, but I think that women are stronger in some ways, not physically, but um, emotionally. And so we could kind of put up for longer periods of time living in, in really, nasty conditions, and, and also maybe because I would get so involved with the people I was working with, um, the families, the, the mothers, the hospitals, that it, it gave me a connection that kind of kept me energized and moving forward, and I felt that I had a goal. So I hope that answers it. <laughs> right ahead. I was really intrigued about your comment that it took you years to develop a style of listening that uh, extracted the type of story that you were interested in. I was wondering if you could speak more to the context of when you realized that the approach that you were taking was not finding that story and the shift towards a listening style that worked and, and what that looks like. You know, I always thought I was a terrible reporter because I never had that kind of um, first of all, I never had a killer instinct of, you know, if there was a scoop or something. It, it wasn't the way I worked. The way I worked was very slow and very, um, you know, again, in a kind of grand way, uh, pretentious way. I, I saw myself more as an anthropologist. I really wanted to understand the culture and how people lived and how war destroyed society. That was more like, how is war breaking down society from the level of the education, the family, the family units? Um, so listening to me meant usually really long time with people, like weeks, sometimes months, which not everyone has the luxury to do. But I'd be living in a besieged city, so I had a lot of time to sit on the floor with people smoking cigarettes. <laughs> 
And that's how it would evolve. And also, I was looking much more for a long-term narrative rather than, I did work for the Times of London, which was a daily newspaper in Iraq, and that was really nerve-wracking for me because I had to produce a story every day, and, and I didn't have the luxury then of listening the way I, I like to listen, which is a, a time thing. And also, I mean, you're a great, you, your rapport with people. I think you have to hear also, it, it's not, it's, you've got to hear what people are saying, like where they're leading you, the direction they're leading you, and, and even if you really don't agree with them, you just have to be quiet and just try to take in their body language, what they're saying. Um, it's such an organic thing that I don't, I don't have a theory for it, you know? I just, it's every person is different, whether you're speaking to a head of state, which I'm not very good at, because I've never, I've never interviewed a head of state that had anything interesting to say. <laughs> or, or a UN senior official, or a diplomat, never. <laughs> I mean, the best things come from ordinary people. Yeah. Yeah. Does that help? I'm, I'm, I feel like I didn't really answer it, but I, I don't really have a, the, I don't really have a theory about about it. Yeah. All right, we'll have our uh, final question, then our closing remarks. Go ahead. Hello. Um, earlier this evening, you said something that at some point journalists finish their reporting assignments and they leave the communities that they've spent all this time at. And there are times when the people that they've spoken to suffer certain consequences for sharing those stories. Yeah. So what I want to know is, what do you do to ensure that after you've left these communities, that the people you've spoken to yeah. don't suffer for sharing their stories with you? That's a really good question. And it's, you know, it's a really big issue, not just for journalists, but also for the gathering of evidence for human rights. And I know that the UN does a lot of work with reprisals of human rights defenders. Um, you have to be so careful with people because you can't, let's say you're working in a closed country like, like Chechnya or Syria, and you interview activists, and then you leave and your story's published, they're killed or their families are killed. Absolutely, that's gonna happen. So what I do, first of all, um, I mean, there's some places you work, like Syria, it would be impossible to speak to activists um, inside Damascus, in the Assad regime side. And like when I would arrange to meet them, I would, um, it was really tricky, and this was before WhatsApp, and you couldn't use internet, and you couldn't talk on the phone because it was bugged, so you would plan it in this incredibly subterfuge way. But I would go to meet them at a bar, and I remember one time going to meet someone, and he was seated there, and he just looked at me and said, and I looked up, and the, Sikh, the Mukabarat, the secret police, were there. So, you know, I'll never know if by him show, even showing up what, what happened, but um, I won't use their name. First of all, I will say to them, only talk to me if you want to. And most of the time, people like that they do want to because they want someone to know what the hell is going on. Incarcerations in prison or torture or whatever is corruption in a country. Um, you have to be very careful. You have to make sure that they, are safe, that they feel safe giving you the information and you do not co coerce them in any way. Um, the second thing is if you can change their name and your newspaper, your news organization is okay with that, you do that and you say this is not their real name. Um, and you try to disguise them as much as possible. But sometimes there are repercussions. I mean, once I wrote a story with the person's permission um, about a woman in Kosovo who had been gang raped. And because the details of the place where it happened, um, it, it was, it was then picked up from my newspaper, translated into Albanian, and published in Pristina. So everyone who read it knew who it was. And it, it made her life hell. And I, I, that was a horrible, painful lesson for me. But I learned my lesson. Um, and now I'm really, really conscious of protecting, protecting your sources. So um, yeah, this is a really, really um, ethical question and an important question. 
going to invite Susan Harada to make some closing remarks. Um, I know that uh, most of us here could go on. <laughs> Very um, compelling. Thank you, Janine, for such a smart and thoughtful talk, and Rita for leading yeah. such an illuminating conversation. Thank you very much. <laughs> and last but not least, thank you very much, all of you, for making the time to come out this evening. And I hope to see you all again next year. Thank you. Thank you.